Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. And there it is. Which instrument do you listen to most in the theme song? That's a good poll. I kind of dig the walking bass line myself. It's Wednesday, everybody. How's it going? Oh, shoot. The B volume is set really <laughs> low. Whoa. That's... It's more like be quiet. Wow, that was harsh. Hope everybody woke up on that. <laughs> Yanked it out. Somebody pulled the plug. <gasps> oh, there's always got to be one glitch after Devlin, right? I and I was just getting set for the accordion solo, and then you just like blanked us out. On oh, me. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Bad face. Oh, bummer. Look at all that weather in the chat, Chris. Man, we got people giving reports from all over. We have fantastic folks from all over the globe, as usual. Yeah, sounds like it's a good day in Chicago. Let's face it, it's a good day everywhere. It ought to be, anyway. However, the weather may or may not be good for you, right? Let's let's make sure that we're not confusing weather with, you know, the fact that, oh, we get to be here. We do and get to be here. We it's Wednesday. It. And we can it make is. your day better by just being here. Oh, well, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That's... <laughs> is that too much pressure? Well, uh, quick, Chris, let's take the pressure off us. Who's our guest right today? Right <laughs> yeah. Anyway, folks, we have Joe Cook with us. Um, Joe's been with us a few times uh, previously, but in case it's your first time meeting Joe uh, here on Idiotic with us, Joe introduce yourself to our gang here oh introduce myself well it's lovely to be back there's so many fabulous names that i recognize and so many fabulous names i do not recognize but hope to recognize in the future uh, i'm in the uk so as andrew says it is not great it is cold and gray there is no surprise mm. there you're absolutely right andrew um and what i've been doing for the last nearly 10 years is running light bulb moment and that's all about virtual design virtual delivery it's all live online stuff and i've been working in learning and development for 25 years for CNN, Time Warner, Turner Broadcasting, that whole big kind of company. Also further in higher education, the charity sector. I will not bore you with all of that. Hello, Jennifer. And um, what I've been doing recently, which is why I'm here, is talking um, and researching about stuff that's virtual and hybrid, but actual research, not just what I think, <laughs> obviously is really important, but what other people think and analyzing it and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and so the other person that's with me today that is not on screen because I like to hog all the limelight myself is my business partner and brother, Mike. He is in the chat. You can say hello to him and he will share all sorts of links and I get to order him around. So things like, <laughs> Please share the link to our website so people know where to find us, um, which he will happily do right now. <laughs> um, so that's what I'm here to do today. Very cool. It's more like magic, right? Like you you could just have skipped telling people Mike was there and you could have just done like, I'm going to go ahead and put my link in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I just need like light bulb magic as the account name instead of his name. If we get rid of him completely, that would just, you know, make it much better, make it look like a <laughs> me. Ooh, he could just be sick and daiquiris on the beach. Yeah, well, then I'd be with him, but that's a whole other <laughs> That's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. So Go we're ahead, here Chris. today. We're here today to discuss um, the, the results of a research project that you and Jane Daly have been doing. Yeah. Um, and you did start this out, um, and we, we talked a bit about this last year, sort of the initial phase of this uh, of this research. And before I forget, I will toss in a link to last year's episode if anybody ever wants to go back. Um, I'm going to throw that in there. 
to the chat in case anybody wants to go revisit that after we're done here. See, compare and contrast. There will be a quiz after, you know, uh, and we'll ask you to compose a small essay. Um, not you, Joe, other people, <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, and um, Anyway. <sighs> so, uh, What's new? <laughs> tell What's us new? first of well, all. Tell us first of all, I guess, what the basis, uh, you know, the research project it, it was about, what you've been looking at, and how you've been doing it, and all sorts of things. And absolutely. So, uh, so as you said, it's with Jane Daly. It's two of us, and she brought all of her research and analysis and behavioral science stuff to this report. And obviously, I could not have done this without her. Um, and obviously, I'm bringing all of the virtual and hybrid stuff. And we, you know, we, there's a crossover of experience, of course. Um, but that's kind of where that came from. Now, in terms of like, you know, why have we done this? Well, um, what we've been looking at is we thought that, you know, since COVID, obviously, the entire world went virtual. But and whilst there's some research out there, we didn't think that there was enough to tell us about what people liked, what people wanted from their virtual and hybrid offerings, what they needed, how they were reacting to things. And we know that, you know, asking people what they want isn't always the best thing. It's just like, well, I want chocolate and daiquiris. However, <laughs> I know I need exercise and fruit. So, you know, we know that there's a, a, a crossing point here. But what people are interested in and what they need is really important. We also wanted to help facilitators, designers, managers, stakeholders, senior decision makers, because this isn't just what do I design in my session and what do I do? This goes all the way up to the chain to what is the corporate culture or the culture in your organization. And why us? Well, as I said, it's about the experience that we both bring to this. And that is the lovely Jane there, the picture. And, and there's more about us in the report as well. So that's kind of why we did it and why we looked at this topic in particular. And obviously hybrid has exploded as everybody's starting going back to conferences, back to work and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, let's talk about that next square in your in your display here. Who did you talk to um, to, to, to gather this info then? Yeah. So we put out a really big survey and I say really big. It was, you know, detailed. It had lots of questions in it, but hopefully it wasn't wasn't too onerous. Um, and what we have in terms of people responding, we had nearly 200 respondents, which is absolutely brilliant um, because Jane and I are UK based unsurprisingly most people that responded were in the UK we did have a US respondent um, but also we had people from around other countries as well and there was a really broad spectrum of ages of types of work types of organization there were some peaks and troughs in there as you can see on this information but um, actually what you've got here is I think it's really important because you could look at this and go, oh, well, there's kind of nothing interesting here. It's like lots of different organizations, lots of sizes. So what? But the way that I look at this is, well, it doesn't matter if I'm in a small or large organization, charity or corporate, whether I'm a young or old person, whether I'm senior or not senior, there's stuff I can take from this. that's actually a universal challenge. And therefore, there are some universal solutions to this as well. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so was there, um, first off, anything that really surprised you in, in the results that you guys had? Um, that is a really good question. Hmm. I think a couple of the things that surprised me, and, and they weren't massive surprises, but it's always interesting what people actually tell you. So we split the report into kind of three main areas, one of which is the learner perspective. And I think one of the things that came through really strongly is we asked people, right, when you're attending a virtual classroom, what is it that you want to attend? What kind of live online learning? And most of the people here uh, responded in that big purple section at the top, said, I want it facilitated and I want a small virtual classroom where there's up to 10 people. Hmm. But then we asked organizations, well, how many people do you normally have on your virtual sessions? They go, well, up to 15 people. And um, actually a really small number said below 10 and, and so on. So that was a real disparity to me. Mm. 
of people kind of going, we want small groups. And then organizations going, we want big groups. <laughs> hmm. <coughs> And, and did you have any insight from uh, from the research, uh, you know, the survey, etc., as to why people felt they preferred small groups um, versus a larger group? Yeah, some of the things that we thought. Now, this isn't kind of a direct answer to your question, hmm. but I think it, we can have an inference from this. So, one of the things that we asked is about people's in, the impact on their well-being of attending these virtual and hybrid sessions, and. 57% of the people that responded said, virtual sessions make me feel tired. And I'm a facilitator, and they make me feel tired. <laughs> so, yeah. Get it. Um, but you can also see here, these are other kind of things. We get frustrated with tech issues. It's hard to concentrate um, and so on. And I think if we look at this from the point of view of what people like and what they don't like, then it's easy to understand, well, why are you tired? Why can't you concentrate? And so if in that left-hand section, people are saying, well, we've got other attendees that don't know how to use the platform. The connectivity doesn't work. Sound doesn't work. My facilitator hasn't designed the session specifically for Zoom, Teams, whatever. The facilitator just talks way too much. Um, and actually, the facilitator doesn't understand the technology. <laughs> we've, we've all been on the sessions where someone's muted. We get that. That's still a thing. But when, you know, the only interaction you get is, can you see my screen? Can you see this slide? You know, this is why people are saying, we don't like it. We feel tired. We can't concentrate. But when they get what they want, i.e. a great facilitator, when they have the opportunity to interact, an opportunity is an important point. It's not saying, oh, well, I want to interact and have to every single time, just like we've got nearly 90 people here. There aren't 90 people continuously typing in the chat which is a good thing, I wouldn't keep up with it. Um, but you've got the opportunity to say something, to comment and to ask when you want to. The sessions have to be designed for virtual. So when you've got those kind of things going on, that's when you get the good sessions. But of course it means as professionals, well, we need time to learn what best practice is. And in other parts of the research we found, that while some people are saying, yeah, there's some good practice, other people are saying we don't get tracked against good practice. Um, so if we don't have the tech skills and the time and the investment in us, well, we're not going to be able to deliver the good sessions. Um, and I think the challenge is from an organization point of view, how do you do that? How do you justify that? And that goes into those much bigger conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. the uh, that that particular conversation about um, the the training departments being prepared to support the need, I think that shows up in a lot of other different reports too out, out in the industry, and it's interesting to uh, to see that reflected here as well. Absolutely, I love some of the comments um, in the in the chat as well, um, where. John Kissinger is saying, yep, VILT definitely breeds fatigue, if not designed and facilitated for maximum engagement and value. And that's why I love what I do, John, as you well know, um, because I love when people at the end of the session go, wow, I didn't realize two hours went past so quickly. Wow, I haven't looked at my email once. It's like, there you go, you can do it. Um, and also Kevin makes a really great point that all those well-being issues I shared, you can see them being more challenging in larger groups. And that's why the small groups are so important. So that's a great yeah. point, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah. I think of even just, um, you know, going back to university experience, you get the the small um, group with the TA, uh, you know, of 10 or 20 people maybe in a room. Well, you can ask questions. You can, you know. Um, but the main lecture is 500 people in the hall. Well, all the lecturer is really going to be able to do is talk to you. Um, <laughs> maybe answer a couple of questions along along the way. And um, um, and, and similarly, you know, if your if your instructor led is moving on to a, a, a virtual platform, but all you do is talk at people, well, uh, record it as a video, <laughs> and then at least people can pause when they need a bio break or you know or whatever. Absolutely, you know, and then you know like, what you can you can use an authoring tool to chop it up and do things with it, and then you can use clips of it as part of your blended learning program. So there's all this available to us, 
But it comes back to that point of organizations, whether that's corporate charity or, or an academic organization saying, we are going to invest in you. We are going to give you the time to learn these things and give you access to the right tools for the job. You know, I can go and edit something on Microsoft Video Editor, whatever it was, and I've done that. But mm -hmm. I soon wanted to upgrade to Camtasia or something else. <laughs> you know? um, thinking about, uh, Gail's mentioning, what's strange is that organizations understand this concept in face-to-face, -face, but, but not in virtual. And I think there's often... Um, that just the you know the convenience, the budget, the get her done aspect. You know, oh well, let's put five hundred people in this session. Um, you know, and then and then it's done. It's out of the way. It's it's yeah, it's finished. It's complete. But uh, whether we're doing this face to face or we're doing something virtual or we're even just doing an asynchronous e learning, you really still have to come back to the standard value adds or the standard purpose of what we have to do, which is to teach people to be able to do something, not simply tell them things, right? Um, you know, that involves things like, uh, you know, reflection and practice and, uh, and, and application goals, those sorts of critical things, rather than simply the attend this webinar and, um, and, and keep your camera on so we know you're watching the screen the whole time. Oh, God, no, don't say that. Uh, um, <laughs> you're, you're right. And, and these are kind of some of the challenges we have. Did I have this uh, just now? Let me go and see if I can find a bit of information. But one of the, the things that we have as professionals is when we never intended to be a virtual trainer. So, you know, then um, uh, COVID came along and made everyone a virtual trainer in the entire world. Um, and the trouble is that people weren't ready for that. They didn't want to. They thought it was this complete new skill set. They thought they'd lose touch with people. And if you do it wrong, then, yeah, it can feel that way. <laughs> Um, and the bottom right hand corner of this challenge for professionals, um, one of this is attendees being um, disinclined to keep their cameras on. So I'd really like to know kind of in, in the chat, um, you know, how many of you either delivering training or attending meetings or uh, whatever kind of your work might be, how many of you find that people are disinclined to keep their cameras on? So how many of you or people you attend with kind of go, nope, no camera from me. It would just be interesting to get that, um, that sense in the chat. But there are all sorts of reasons for it. It could be bandwidth, could be personal, could be I like to look out the window and think and I can't do that on camera. Or you've invited me to a meeting that is going to be of no use to me whatsoever and no benefit <laughs> to me attending. So I want to get through my email instead. And the same applies to learning. Um, so it depends on the type of meeting, maybe 50-50. If they do, they aren't paying attention. 50-50. Um, interesting, Gail says, just ran a session this morning, three women on webcam, two men camera off. You know, it's a tiny sample, but it's an interesting story, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and JB says 92% of 1,600 learners um, found seeing another person helps them make a, a human connection. And there's all sorts of research on that. What Mike will do is on our community, we've got a webcam kind of uh, research kind of thread there. Um, and he'll go and share the link to that. So there's loads of research to say, yes, do it. And there's loads of research about video in, in kind of e-learning that you can apply. But there's also research that says it's fatiguing and we have to look at ourselves on camera and all of that stuff. So it's just finding that balance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, um, you, most of my sessions when I'm using a, a virtual tool are, are relatively smaller groups, you know, in the 10, sometimes occasionally up to 20. Um, and my preference is to just tell people, you know, leave it on if you want, no need to have it on. Um, I do often have to do sessions from my home where bandwidth is poor. So I typically in those don't even run my own video, except for, you know, saying, you know, introducing my face at the beginning of the session, or, you know, time together, um, etc. cetera. Um, but then again, those are long sessions where you're, we're teaching, you know, people say for, you know, a three or four hour, you know, block, obviously breaks and all that stuff. But, you know, uh, you, trying to have someone hold their facial expression and, not scratch their nose, <laughs> you know, we're, we're human. Just turn your video camera off and, and you're adults. Uh, I trust you, you know, if you're here because you're you're, you're learning something, I, I, I trust you. That's part of, I feel it's the, uh, you know, it's the, the the contract I make is that you're, you're adults, you're in charge of your own learning. I, I'm, I'm here to, mm -hmm. to, to, to guide you through all of this, uh, et cetera. But if, 
you know, hey, if that email comes with that exclamation mark and it's from your boss, I'm not going to tell you, no, can you turn your camera yeah. on? Like, like, I am hello. not more important than the boss. No, yeah. exactly. So, so <laughs> I think I, I think too often there's this presumption that, that um, you, you know, if, if, if these folks were in a room with me, they'd still be picking up their phone and checking their emails. They'd still have other things going on. You know, if we were all live in, in the same room doing this stuff too, why should that change, you know, in a, in a virtual environment? And, and it's really interesting. Uh, Mike's just sharing in the chat. We ran a session uh, this week where people are starting to actually have anxiety when they can't have their mm. webcam. So we had a lady who was using her mobile phone as a hotspot because she was having internet trouble. And so if she came on webcam, we just couldn't hear her audio at all. Mm. And, and she was saying, I'm still here, I'm paying attention, I promise, oh, I feel so bad, and we're talking about webcams, and we're like, we're cool, we're fine, don't worry. <laughs> because guess what? There's this thing called digital body language, and you're answering things in chat, and you're adding stuff on the whiteboard, and you're clicking the mm -hmm. hand up, clicking the green check mark, and you know, I am not worried about you not being here. And to your point, Chris, if you're not here, I trust you need to be somewhere else. And that's <laughs> cool. you know? Yeah, I think I think that that's a that's a great point, Joe. In that the design of the engagement should encourage the engagement. It, there, sh we shouldn't have gimmicks and be forcing people yeah. to, you know, hey, we don't, you know, we don't we don't trust you or whatever that whatever however we refer to it right you you got to have your camera on because we want to make sure you're engaged instead why don't we look at it as an opportunity and say we should be redesigning our training and our courses so that we are constantly allowing those attendees to engage with us in digital ways to your point right like with the whiteboard the the clicking the raising the hand the the typing in the chat like we do here i gotta say you know but one of the things i absolutely love about crowdcast and doing these live streams and and doing idiotic is the chat room you folks hanging out with us and you know letting it be all of us a community to me is the this is that's the best part about this you know having guests is fantastic <laughs> but if it was just the three of us you know it might get kind of old after a while. It's fun to get you all speak for yourself, Brent. <laughs> well, okay. I... <laughs> so, so it... <laughs> maybe that was maybe I put that the wrong way. You know, I love the variety. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is the problem when we are just presenting in a, a webinar or a lecture or something, and there are spaces and times where that's appropriate and really good, and they can be great. But one of the problems it generates is we don't have anything to bounce off of. We don't have anything where I can kind of, like John's saying, let's hear it for the chat room, whoop, whoop. You know, there's nothing for me to respond to if there's nothing there that people are doing, if there's no feedback. Right. And, and then if we're talking about this from a learning point of view, um, you know, if I'm asking you a question, what does two plus two mean? And everybody types five in the chat. It's like, huh. I need to go over some basic stuff with you. And there's that learning feedback as well. So, um, <laughs> Jeff, I'm not saying woot. That is no, not me. Um, but uh, it's really important that we have that interaction. Um, and uh, I think the instructional design point of view is really important because um, good learning design is good learning design. It doesn't matter whether it's e-learning, whether it's video, whether it's um, virtual, whether it's face-to-face -face or not. But each of those things needs their specialism. I am not an e-learning designer. I've done it. I can do it, but that doesn't make me good at it. That doesn't make me understand the nuances of how people learn that way. So just like, you know, you can be a great trainer, you can be a great virtual trainer, but you've got to learn those new things to help you. And that's where a report like this comes in is it's saying, hey, look, learners are saying this and um, professionals are saying we've got challenges with this. So we're trying to say to organizations, maybe you need to think about this. <laughs> Because it's not just about making sure L and D are happy or making sure your staff are okay. It's making sure they can do their job so that your business succeeds and that your clients are happy in whatever fashion that takes for your organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, JB had a, a reference in the um, in the chat a, a little bit ago about you know having the webcam on. If it's just present uh, presentism. 
um, then it's not an, an effective tool. And, and Gail's comment earlier in the chat as well about having WhatsApp situated on our monitor. People are going to game it anyway, right? Uh, you, you know, um, everybody's playing, <laughs> you know, video games maybe right below their webcams. It looks like they're looking at the screen. You know, you have to you have to be prepared to treat people like adults first off. That's which is yes, sort of a a strange thing to say maybe, but uh, sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Anne makes a great point too. A, a helper is nice. We like to call that helper the producer. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and also, I mean, we were teaching this just this week is, yeah, it's amazing that I've got Mike. He is on 99% of my sessions and don't tell him, but to be honest, I find him invaluable now. Even though for five years I ran light bulb moment <laughs> without him, fine. And it could um, happen again. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> just you beware. But, but the point being, you know, is you can do it without that second person. And most of us probably have to do it without that second person. Mm -hmm. So then it's looking at the techniques that we use. And, and that's probably a bit too much detail for today. But just one really good example is I can be the one to decide and communicate to you how that will work. So, for example, today I could have said, I am not paying attention to chat, it's moving too quickly, I can't cope with it. But if you have a question you want me to answer, guess what, there's a question section at the bottom and I will look at that. So that's just one example of us taking control yeah, yeah. of the platform and what we're doing and not letting our, it control us. For sure. Um, well, let's circle back to, to the research study again. Um, anything, you know, what else? Uh, what else did you find? as part of the, the survey that you guys were doing? All sorts of stuff. So mm -hmm. I think one of the things that probably is going to be kind of interesting for people as it's a relatively new kind of area is this hybrid perspective. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can let us know in the chat or you can ask a question if you're thinking, um, you know, you've got particular experiences or feelings or questions about this. Um, and I think that's a, a kind of a really important area to look at because it is new for a lot of people. So um, we asked people kind of what type of um, sessions they were offering huge amount of webinars and classrooms, a few conferences, some coaching assessments, uh, and hybrid was kind of way down towards the bottom. So a really low percentage of people doing this, um, which is kind of interesting in itself. We also asked kind of what are the kind of differences that learning professionals ex are experiencing when we compare it to virtual classrooms? And I think understanding what it is and how it's different is really important and we've probably all experienced this in different ways where management go oh let's do this new shiny thing i learned about at a conference at devlearn this week or whatever it might be without really understanding it i remember working on 70 20 10 stuff with charles jennings and it was just like right let's do 70 20 10 it's just like let's pay for someone expensive with a big name and go and do the latest greatest thing and not necessarily letting Charles free to do the amazing work that he can. So I think you know, when people don't understand even what virtual is, let alone what hybrid is, we have to think about that. Um, another great point in the middle here is about the quality um, before you get to hybrid. So if your virtual quality isn't great, quite frankly, your hybrid quality is not going to be either because hybrid is a subset of virtual. Um, and as it says here at the bottom, well, you need to be great virtual trainers before you can tackle hybrid. So uh, last year, I co-designed and co-hosted the Speaks Exchange Conference, uh, and that was a hybrid conference. We're doing it again this year. It's later this month. And it takes a lot of tech. It takes a lot of planning. It takes an in-person facilitator and an online facilitator, which is me. And I think the trouble is people don't realize just how expensive that is and how challenging that is. And then if we broaden that out a bit, so this is looking at virtual and hybrid, there's a real disparity here between the answers that we've got where people are saying that they feel capable of designing and delivering virtual and hybrid versus feeling confident. And, you know, we could go into a lot of detail here. One example, one way we could take this is, well, I feel capable of the stuff I can do. I'm um, sorry, I feel confident in the stuff that I can do, the kind of beginner, intermediate maybe, but I actually don't feel capable of a lot of other stuff. 
But the other way we could look at this is the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is unconscious incompetence, if I think I've got that right. <laughs> um, that's, that's a tricky one for me to say this afternoon. So I think there are some, some interesting challenges here, and um, I'm waiting to see if there's anything I should have picked up from the chat from you guys. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot in there. And I, I, one thing I was just going to ask that we kind of just define what is hybrid. I think hybrid means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So how, how did you define it when going about the research? Okay, so it's a petrol engine and batteries. No, no, sorry. Exactly. Um, <laughs> this is the trouble. We've got hybrid cars. We've got hybrid working. I saw the term the other day, hybrid war, with regard to what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Oh. <clears throat> and I was just like, what is this? Because they were talking about it's social, it's political, it's economic. And I just thought that was war generally, but maybe I don't know. So this word hybrid is kind of really challenging. Yeah. The way I look at this for learning is um, if we start with blended learning, um, blended learning usually means a really good mix of let's do some e-learning, let's do something face-to-face, -face, let's do some virtual stuff, let's have some coaching, and picking the right modalities for the learning journey that people are on. Okay. So that is one thing, and a lot of people are using the term hybrid training or learning to define what I call blended, and what that term has been around for as long as I can remember. So the hybrid is when you have some people virtual, like we are today, we're all, you know, Canada, America, UK, all around the world. And also when you have some people together, so that could be 5, 10, 50 people in one room, or it could be more than one location. So traditionally it might be, right, we've got people in the Berlin office and we've got 20 people online around the world. That is a hybrid live synchronous session. So the it's the it's the 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 fact that in your definition what is what is different than the blended is that it's synchronous. It's everybody's doing it at the same time. They're yeah. just using different modalities to access the same thing, versus a blended structure which takes you through different modalities for different potential content top, uh, yeah. areas, etc. As part of a pathway, then cool. Yeah, absolutely. That's mm. that's good to know because I have kind of always how you defined the how you defined blended learning is how I've often thought of hybrid learning. And when people mention the phrase that it's, that it's a, a, that it's a mix of e-learning in classroom, micro learning, you know, stuff before the classroom, the actual activities and things in the classroom, and then some post, uh, you know, event, you know, slow drip learning or reminders, all that kind of whatever terms we yeah. want to use for it. Right. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of how I always thought it, but I, I, I'm going to have to rethink that now. I, I like how you guys do that. Well, it's I, I, the reason I think it's separate is for that point that it's the synchronous bit. Yeah. Because, you know, we I don't think blended learning is synchronous. Like you say, it's about the journey. And that could be a week. It could be six weeks. It could be a year. Um, it could be self-directed learning. What I decide to do one day is read a book, watch a video, whatever. Or it could be the program that's designed and put on offer from the organization. So I think that's why it's important to use that term blended and not in the term of, you know, oh, that rubbish blended learning. Oh, I've got to do an <laughs> e-learning course. It's just like, no, that's that's just bad e-learning. Um, you know, it's about using these terms kind of properly and designing and delivering them really well so they don't get that poor reputation. Got it. And, and Jennifer in chat has put hybrid session versus hybrid learning. So I think a hybrid, maybe you're picking up on my language, Jennifer. I, I'm not sure if what exactly that question is. But by session, I mean a learning session, a training session, a learning intervention. Um, but also, you know, we can have hybrid work, which is not synchronous necessarily, although some people might be at home, some people might be in the office. And we can have hybrid meetings which are synchronous. So it, it's a real challenge um how we look at this um but either way it's about some people being together and some people being live online that's kind of the basics <laughs> that's a that's it's a great simple way to look at it there there's an interesting question in the question box that i wanted mm. to make sure we got to um today and um there's no name next to it so i'm just going to ask the question what right do we have to insist people connect on our terms? Surely we're the ones who should be respecting the people engaging with us. 
I found that to be kind of interesting and for a lot of different reasons. What, 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 how, what do you think? I love that. Absolutely love that. Whoever wrote that, user 021973, blah, whatever you are. <laughs> um, and, and I think there's a couple of ways that we can look at this. So, so maybe this came off the back of the webcam conversation is where I'm assuming this came from. And, and I, we absolutely should be respecting people that are engaging with us. So for example, when um, Chris was talking about, you know, your adult learners, if you need to answer that email from your boss, you get ahead. You know, we're respecting mm -hmm. where people are in their life, in their work, where they are physically. Um, and the other way to look at this as well, and the reason that I talk so much about interaction and all of this stuff is that we should be honoring the lifetime people are with us. All of you guys today, nearly a hundred of you, are, I hope investing, but at least spending an hour here in live online with me, with Chris, with Brent. And we've got to respect that and make the most of it for you. So the other way of looking at this though, about insisting people connect on our terms, is there is a certain level of, you know, we are the organization that employs you, or we are the organization that's asked you to attend this training to develop your skills to use in our business. Or in my case, I'm a vendor and I'm a specialist. So there's an element of you might not want to do it this way as a learner, but I'm going to ask you to trust me that this is the best thing and the best way for you to learn. So on our learning, uh, it's not really a management system, but on our kind of course hub, as we call it, where we've got all our resources and everything, one of the first things we ask people to read is about active learning. And there's a link to a bit of research and whatnot. And it basically says, we're going to make you do stuff and we're going to ask you to reflect and we're going to get you involved and you might not want to, but you'll learn stuff and it's the best way for you to do it. And that's what we're kind of saying there because therefore you need to meet me on my terms to a certain degree. But it's how you get those and weave those together mm -hmm. that is the art and the science of what we do. But great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Oh, it was Andrew who asked the question. I knew it was from someone clever, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, the... the, the 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 blended hybrid thing um i think i mentioned in a tweet or commenting on linkedin was uh, seems to be a, a pretty hot topic at devlearn this year so i was um it's i'm glad we had a chance to have this conversation um about that for sure from a um uh well yeah jump into the slides here we go well no go ahead because my slides might answer your question okay <laughs> Uh, well, what, well, I was just thinking maybe in, in uh, you know, the, the remaining few minutes of our conversation today, we, we maybe do talk about some of the technical stuff, dive a little deep, or maybe, uh, you know, uh, a quick, quick couple, you know, quick hit tips or, you know, what's your, mm -hmm. you know, how do you use the tools that you have, that kind of thing. Okay, so let me run through a couple of quick things on the recommendations. I see Jeff's okay. answer question as well, and I will answer that. Um, because I wanted to share one thing in particular, which is oh, um, cool. we've got in the report a journey map, um, a kind of stepped process you can go through, whatever it might be. And whilst this isn't answering kind of the deep technical questions, I think the point here is it allows organizations and individuals and, with, and teams as well to look at where am I? Where are, are we at stage one, stage two? How do we move on from this? What management communication do we need? Um, and what do we need to do? And, and things like at the bottom here of the green of this blue section, let me go back. It says exploit stable technology and use add-on apps. Well, if you haven't got access to the technology, if you haven't got a senior management people talking to IT so that L&D and IT can talk together, well, you know, none of that stuff is going to work. So I think that kind of thing is really important to go and share. So that's why I wanted to kind of quickly jump to, to that one. Um, in terms of the technology, um, Jeff, you're right about making it scalable for a hybrid technology. So um, a lot of it depends on your budget. It depends on how much and how often this is likely to be the case in your organization. 
and it will also depend on the skills of the people involved and the people involved is not just the trainer it's not just i am designing my session and then i'm going to run my session whether it's face to face or virtual it can be but it probably shouldn't it should be involving people in the physical location which might be where the trainer is it might involve people in the remote location. So for example, you might have 10 people in the Sydney office together, as opposed to everybody in Australia at their own computer. So we have to think about lots of different ways that this might work. And uh, the key things we have to think about is that everyone, so that's virtual attendees, physical attendees, which could be more than one location, and the facilitator and any support staff all need to be able to see, hear, and do the same things. So this means what cameras, what laptops, what audio connections, how we're going to have breakout rooms inside of our conversations, how can we make sure that somebody interrupting can hear somebody else, how can a facilitator see all of the attendees, how can all of the attendees see all of the other attendees, I'm going to stop and take a breath, there's a lot. <laughs> so, you know, in terms of which tech, Jeff, I wish I could answer that for you and say, you just need this, this and this and job done. But mm -hmm. it depends whether you've got no budget or 30,000 euro budget um, and, and anything in between. But if you think about that, see, hear, do, and every part of that puzzle needs to be able to do that together, that at least starts you in that right direction. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yep. See, hear, do. Let's make that a phrase. Let's make that a thing. Yeah. Do, do you have t-shirts with that on it? <laughs> I wish I did. I should, do you know what I should do? I should get a mug. <laughs> oh, there we go. There you go. You need Definitely idea. see, hear, do all the time. <laughs> That's what we do. Right? <laughs> but... Well, uh, see here and, and do, do put in to the chat. I know Mike shared it once already, but a link to uh, where folks can connect uh, with you, but more particularly find the report in case they want to dig into it more. Uh, that's Mike's cue to start pay, copy and paste. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and oh, I hear the music. Um, and Joe, as always, it's lovely to see you on Idiotic with us. Um, Thank and and so thanks much. so much for thanks so much for, for being able to jump in and and, um, and and share this stuff with us. I think I'm looking forward to seeing what happens for next year's version or next year's iteration of this information. To see, it. are we making progress? Are things getting better? Are people getting better at doing this thing? And Chris, uh, who brings us idiotic today? Oh, funny you should ask that, Brent. Idiotic is, of course, sponsored by Domino Learning Systems. Um, we do some pretty cool things here ourselves in terms of e-learning authoring and more. Um, and I'm just looking for the, oh, there it is. The copy paste on my side, I was a little slow. There goes the paste. If you're interested in learning, there's a link in the chat uh, that uh, can help you find out more about Domino One. We'd love to also talk with you more. Um, as Thank always- Thank you, Joe, for hanging out. Yeah, and thanks so much to the folks in the chat. This has been one of the best chatty sessions we've had in a while. So yeah. lots of good stuff going on there. You guys are great. We love the chat room. Let's dance on out of here. Yeah. Thanks, gang. Oh, yeah, I love the special effects. Yeah, excellent joke. <laughs> Adios, everybody.